Robinson. Robinson. We're really excited to be a part of this. I know the acronym is funky, ERS, but Emergency uh, Suicide Prevention Grant, along with OHA and, um, and our PSU partners, and really getting this opportunity to have uh, the local domestic and violence domestic violence and sexual assault organizations work really collaboratively and some of you already do and some of you are going to even further strengthen that relationship and for some of you it's a new relationship so we're really looking forward to uh to this presentation and to this project that we're all working on um i am one of those people like vanessa said that i have kids doing online school but i think i am plugged in and ready to go and um hopefully the dog won't bark at the post office person uh, but we'll roll with it. Oh yeah, I love when your your dog barks. <laughs> it's always fun. <laughs> Rowan has a dog as well that barks. Rowan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rowan. Uh, Rowan Schwartz. I use they them pronouns. Um, I am the executive administrative assistant, and I'm just here for support. So um, feel free to directly chat me or um, you know whatever. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And just so everyone knows, we are recording. Thank you, Rowan. So we are at the exact number where we don't get to do individual check-ins because it takes too much time. So um, what I will ask you to do, if we are 24 or, or 25 or less, then we, give, we take the time to do individual kind of unmute yourself, but I don't think we're gonna have enough time for that. So if you can just introduce your, yourself in the chat uh, just say whatever you want to say about yourself so that folks know who's in the room. Um, just check in with your name, your organization, um, your favorite food, <laughs> what you're planning to do for fun this weekend, whatever really works for you so that we get to build our community. And um, Carrie, you can go ahead while folks are, are checking in, we can go ahead and, and share our screen and jump right in. I know we have a lot of content to cover. Okay, can you all see that all right? So um, I may at some point uh, turn my camera off just so that um, things run more smoothly. Just know that, um, yeah, I don't have the best internet. I'm in the suburbs in Vancouver, Washington, and everyone out here is working from home and their kids are all in school. So if I have any fellow suburbanites out there, you know what a nightmare this Zoom thing can really be because it just slows down all of our internet and it's crazy. Um, and uh, so let's jump in and talk a little bit. Uh, Carrie, if you can go to the next slide, I'll chat a bit about what we're going to cover today. Great. So uh, Carrie and I put this, this uh, training together specifically for this audience. And we're going to talk a little bit about the prevalence of domestic and sexual violence in our state. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the healthcare stats in terms of domestic and sexual violence. Um, so we have some statistics to cover. Um, and then we're gonna define domestic violence, right? This is one of those topics that everyone has heard about. Many of us have lived with it, um, but we wanna really get clear about what do we mean when we say that? What are we talking about specifically? And then we're gonna talk a little bit about patterns of abuse and some of the tactics of abuse that are used um, against survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, we're also gonna talk about the impact of COVID-19 on domestic and sexual violence. There's been significant impact both in our own state and nationally. Um, we're gonna talk about the, the impact of domestic violence on mental health outcomes. And we're going to talk a bit about trauma and toxic stress. And, we're, and I will include a little about cultural impacts of to toxic stress and the epigenetic impact of historical um, trauma. So we'll just touch on that. We'll do more on that in our um, second webinar. Um, so, and we'll talk about uh, the second webinar in the end. So today is just to kind of begin those overviews, to begin to discuss those overviews. And we're going to uh, provide some best practice ideas. We'll go in again in more depth in the second one to, for that today. We're going to introduce some of those best practices and, and hopefully we'll have a little time to do at least one case review. 
Carrie, would you add anything to our intentions today that I missed? Um, no, I don't think so. I think um, I understand that there's a couple of folks typing into the chat box. I just want to explain that cameras do not need to be turned off if their own bandwidth is going okay. It does not impact the overall presentation. It is a local mm -hmm. thing. So if you are it's having just... a challenge with something freezing or you um, are not hearing right, first turn off your own camera to see if that fixes that. But everybody does not need to have their camera off unless they would like to. You are welcome to turn it off if you don't want to be part of the recording. Yeah. Um, I'm going to check in also, are you all able to see the one slide or are you seeing my slideshow that says next slide? We're seeing next slide, <laughs> Carrie. Yeah, okay. the next slide. Can you make it the slideshow? I'm going to try to do that right now. Is that Normala? Hi, Normala. That is Normala. Hi, Vanessa and Carrie. It's Normala. It's so good to hear your voice. I recognize you from the phone. <laughs> There, how's that? Oops. We don't, we don't have the slideshow. Yeah, now we the slideshow is working on it right now. Okay, Vanessa, can you okay, see Vanessa. that? I'm gonna ask just for Vanessa to give me feedback so I can I can hear and and uh, not get confused. Sorry, everybody. Okay, Vanessa. So Carrie, right now I am not seeing your slideshow. We're going to try this one try more time. And I'm also hearing a little bit of an echo, which I'm not sure what's going on with that. We didn't have that earlier either. Okay. Let me just close out of here. Oh. I am going to try to get this up again. I apologize. This is definitely one of those. Um, Rowan, snafus. Rowan, can you offer some support here? Rowan is supporting me. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm getting text from them. Okay. Okay. Well, Carrie, while you work on that, I'm just going to jump in, um, just so that we're not. You know, I want to be respectful of everyone. Oh, I'm seeing it now. That's the way it works. The minute you think you're going to do something else, it all starts working. Can you advance it? Awesome. Okay. So Carrie, if we can go to the first slide that we're, um, okay. Great. Okay, well, I wanted to start our conversation with a little bit of uh, about us and what we do at the coalition. So the Oregon Coalition is a nonprofit uh, feminist organization, which does um, is a distinction that we inherited from our founders that we're very proud of. We were founded in 1978 one of the first coalitions to be founded in the United States. I think there were two founded at the same time. And so we go back and forth thinking we were first. Uh, so I'll be politically correct and say one of the first. Um, currently our membership includes 50 community-based DVSA programs, including tribal programs. Those are programs that um, work directly with survivors of domestic and sexual violence um, in their communities. Eric, you can advance that. One of the questions people often ask is what do those agencies do? What do the programs that we um, support and work with do? And they provide a lot of the, the services that domestic and sexual violence survivors need in their communities. They provide advocacy, shelter, safety planning, support groups, uh, food boxes, uh, child care, um, batters intervention. Some, some programs provide therapeutic practices. I know that happens in Clackamas County. They provide education. Some provide culturally specific supports for folks who are either deaf or hard of hearing. That's one of the culturally specific programs in our state. Also, um, uh, there's specific services for 
Latinx and Hispanic folk. And there's a, a program in Portland, Oregon for African-American survivors. So we have a lot of different culturally specific and that's literally three out of probably 12. So I, I didn't even touch on, on all of them. Um, but just know that there are services for folks who are more marginalized because domestic and sexual violence requires a very personal um, response. One size certainly does not fit all in our, in our field. Carrie, would you add anything to that? No, she's advancing slides. <laughs> Sorry, no, I think that you covered that very well. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. The other thing I want to talk about is specific, a little bit specifically about the role of advocate. This is something that folks ask a lot when they're making referrals. What can I expect when that referral is made? What are the, you know, what will an advocate actually do? And also people often ask, you know, what is the methodology or the scholarship of your field? And so I really like to tell people kind of um, in the broadest way possible what advocates act actually do and what are some of the values and, um, and uh, mission of our field and our work, how we do our work. We are always survivor centered in our practices. So that means that the survivor leads the response. We're never ahead of a survivor in what to do or how to do it. We bring our expertise to the table, but we don't bring, we're not advice givers, we're not therapists. We're absolutely advocates, which means we walk alongside. And if we're gonna be um, ste stepping anyway from the side of a survivor, we're gonna step back behind them and let them lead the way. Um, we're, we have a social justice focus with human rights. Our work doesn't just happen on an individual level, it happens on the, both the micro and the macro level. We do a lot of public policy work, a lot of systems advocacy work, a lot of social justice work. You'll find advocates in hospitals at, uh, co-located at DHS. You'll find advocates working in prisons. You'll find advocates working in clinics. Um, and so wherever you'll find survivors, you also will often find advocates doing their work with survivors. Um, which means we have a collabor collaborative framework. We really value relationships with other organizations and other fields. Um, and so we're always happiest when we can collaborate and make, both, make stronger both our system and the system of those that we're working with. And that way we're creating a holistic approach to ending violence and treating violence. Um, we have an intersectional framework. You'll hear advocates talk a lot about intersectionality, meaning that a survivor's life um, isn't just boiled down to one issue or one problem. While we're addressing domestic violence, we're often addressing economic insecurity. We're often addressing health issues. We're often addressing um, historical trauma or childhood trauma issues. So that intersectionality, meeting a survivor where they're at, letting them lead the way, but also addressing the complexity of all of the issues that they face. Um, and this, that, this leads us to doing a lot of holistic strategies, looking for strategies that are um, broad and deep, um, but also very individual and um, led by the survivor themselves. So that's a little bit about our scholarship and our kind of how we do our work our values, what's important to us as advocates. So Carrie, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in a bit about that if you have something to add. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. Um, I think it's important to note that advocates are really well trained in a variety of the systems, like what Vanessa said, systems advocacy, so that they can walk beside the survivor, let them know maybe how the criminal justice system might work, how DHS system might work, but they're not there to tell them which direction to take just to support them in their knowing and their learning and the um, of what their options are and then to support them no matter what those options may be um, and to help them navigate barriers especially those culturally specific programs uh, working with um, survivors that are from historically marginalized communities and helping navigate barriers that may be in place either around language um, access um, historical relationship with the criminal justice system or real current relationship so that our advocates really are there and well-trained in, in all of these systems. And uh, we're really excited uh, to strengthen 
their relationship with the health, um, uh, the behavioral health and mental health systems and the suicide prevention right now. It's right in line with what, what we do. Thank you, Carrie. Mm -hmm. So um, I will just ask if there's any questions at this point. Um, you can either type them in the chat box or just unmute yourself. Do you have any questions about what the coalition does or what advocates do before we start to dive into prevalence? Great. Okay. All right, Kara, I always give a little more time for people to unmute or collect their thoughts, but um, okay, Carrie, let's talk a bit about prevalence. And this is oh, both yeah. of us chatting about this, so you can unmute it as well. Great, um, I am unmuted and I'll go ahead. Okay. Do you want, um, you want to start with this slide? Sure. So we were asked and we really, we know many of you probably are aware of what's happening nationally. We wanted to really focus in on Oregon. Um, and talk to you about what is happening here in our state. So uh, here's some of the information in 2018, one report um, from one of our reports, 28 people in Oregon lost their lives to domestic violence, as well as 14 of Oregon's 36 counties had at least one fatal domestic violence incident. Uh, the Oregon Coalition participates in our a, um, a oh, fatality review committee, a statewide fatality review committee. And that's where that um, some of that information comes from. Uh, in 2015, more than 10,000 survivors of domestic violence were unable to access emergency shelter due to the lack of program funding. And that's from a Count Her In report from the Women's Foundation. Correct, Vanessa? It is. And I think what's in interesting about you know, I always think about why do we start with statistics? Why? And I think okay. that what we what we're wanting folks to really kind of lean into and really notice mm -hmm. is that domestic violence can be lethal, right? When you think about 28 survivor or 28 folks lost their lives in 2018. We know 2019 information hasn't been compiled yet, but it's still um probably as high, could be higher. And 2020, we know it's going to be higher. So this is just a way to realize that it is lethal, right? That domestic violence can be lethal. And I think the second stat that, that Carrie mentioned really tells us that survivors are asking for help every day. And, and for it is vigorous and as um, dedicated as our system is, many of them, those calls go without us being able to, to um, effectively create safety in those people's lives. So that it's about framing the issue, um, you know, and Carrie, you, do you want to go on with the other two stats or should sure. we? Yeah, yep, okay. I can do that. You all can read them, but it is important. Uh, so um, the Oregon domestic violence hotlines receive approximately 21,000 calls a day and almost a one third of those, one third of women in Oregon report experiencing domestic or, and or sexual violence. Uh, so that really shows us that many of you in this room, in this meeting, um, know someone, either personally, uh, your neighbor, family member, have personal experience or have known about her. Um, and so this issue really impacts everybody. Um, and in the Pacific Northwest, women who have experienced abuse uh, utilize mental health resources significantly more than women who have never experienced abuse. And that's from um, one of our National TA providers, Futures Without Violence, that we've worked with collaboratively for quite some time. Thanks, Carrie. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think we've all heard this stat of one in four women and one in seven men experience severe physical violence in their lifetime. What we know as advocates is that number's higher, right? Of when we talk about domestic violence, and we're going to get to the definition pretty quickly here. Um, but that's a lot. Just imagine the four people that you know, right? That one of them likely has experienced violence. Um, so, you know, I think that sometimes these stats feel like just numbers, but if you think about it, these are people that you love and care about. Um, I think this is a staggering statistic that 64% of tr transgender individuals experience sexual assault in their lifetime, right? That there's, that's, uh, and 34%, percent um, report physical abuse. What I know is that 10% of 
of um, that the overall number for that um, for for survivors the one in four when you look at that that's almost 10 to 15 percent higher is what I've heard, been told that that number tells us that um, so the, uh, the next slide and I'm not going to read all of them because you guys have those and can read them but I'm just going to point out some of them that are that are um, start um, and uh, among women enrolled in large health maintenance organization, 44% reported having experienced abuse. So we're, this is just more letting us know that the issue is impacting our communities in significant ways. And we can move on from those. And, and But unless you have questions about that, I'll um, just leave you to read the rest of those on your own. OK. So. When we think about defining domestic violence, we always we usually start with what do you know? You know, what do you know about domestic violence? So if you can start kind of just in the chat, um, typing in just what do you know, you know, and where does your knowledge come from and how has it impacted your community? What I've learned from folks is that as I've done this training many times in, in, with healthcare providers, is that it's very common that that healthcare providers have been first responders. They already know a lot about this issue. They have come into contact with their coworkers, with the the with um, their patients, with the people that they're working with. It's very common that you already have had that um, that experience, unfortunately. So I I don't know where my chat. Uh, Okay, so I'm seeing that someone's mentioned that they helped their mother get out of a violent relationship. Mm -hmm. What else? What What do you know about domestic violence? What do you already know? What's your What does your your gut tell you? What does your wisdom tell you that you you know you're here at this training, but you bring some wisdom to the table. What, what do you already know? That's about power. Thank you. You know, someone says that they're that they uh, were in a violent relationship and that their love that idea that it's about power. It's absolutely oh darn. I'm gonna have to turn that off. <laughs> my my bandwidth was messing with me, but um, that it's about power, right? It's about power and control. Absolutely. What else do we know? Anybody else? I see someone else. What I'm hearing, Vanessa, um, it's about control and belittling, and I think uh, that mm -hmm. that use of uh, verbal abuse gets to that definitely. That is that verbal yes. abuse and emotional abuse is very much a part of how of how it goes. Right. Hi. So we already know a lot, right? Hi, this is Nirmala. Can I just contribute? Absolutely. I, it um, to me, uh, if I take a cross cultural view across the globe. It's uh -huh. also, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, uh, infused with uh, patriarchy and also with um, economic uh, dependence. Absolutely, normal. Absolutely right? Normal. Oops. So, so that's some of what we know, right? We know that it is economic, that it is about power and control, that it's about patriarchy, about male dominance, that there's a gendered element to it. We know that it affects our, us on many levels and many of our relationships, right? So we already know a lot about this issue. And I think that that's always a really great place to start because that wisdom that you already carry is valuable. And it's really, when you think about working with survivors, it's passed from, from generation to generation. Absolutely, absolutely. And so when we think about, um, that wisdom that you already know is going to honestly be your best ally. And that's why I always start with that because you know I can share my wisdom, but your wisdom and what you are already carrying for survivors, that's huge. And they tell us that, that their best supporters are those who have direct experience in some way. So Carrie, is there anything you would add before we go on to the next slide? No, I think someone already brought up a great point which we're gonna to talk to about it. Um, the person who is employing that power and control does it by choice. It's not necessarily caused mm -hmm. by substance or alcohol use. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more yeah. later on in the presentation. Um, there is a question right. that a person who uses substance or alcohol use to 
can the person use substance or alcohol use exert power and control? And Chris, thanks for the oh, question. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to absolutely. talk about how that plays into it as we move into this, right, Vanessa? Right. Okay. Yeah, we are, but I want to answer now because it's fresh in my mind, um, is the how of that, right? And so we know that um, the, you know, perpetrators of, of violence are looking for control and the use of drugs and alcohol can definitely be one of the tactics of power and control. And I wanna be clear that it's not necessarily a cause of violence, right? There are people who struggle with drug and alcohol addiction that are never violent, not a day in their lives. And so as much as, as that can be used as a tactic of control and power over another person, you will see that as a tactic. And, but there's so many other tactics as well, is how I, I like to answer that question because um, there is a lot of myths. There's a lot of mythology around domestic and sexual violence. And one of the big ones is that um, its cause is alcohol use or because, you know, and it's just one of the bigger, the bigger myths that are out there. Any, are there any other chats that I'm not seeing, Carrie? Because you know I'm not watching chats, right? <laughs> I know, this is why. No, that was it. I think okay. we're going to do that. I think, I'm glad that that question was brought up and um, the point was brought up from two people. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the next thing we're going to check, let's talk about the definition, like the actual, I think is it the next yep, slide is the... Here we go. Yeah, so, so this is the definition that that we are that we use at the coalition, and we use it when we're doing our fatality reviews and our fatality reports. Um, we do it when we're writing our grants. So this is the definition that we use every day when we're doing this work, and it is that domestic violence is a pattern of coercive tactics that include physical, psychological, sexual, economic, and emotional abuse perpetrated by one person against an intimate partner with the goal of establishing and maintaining power and control, okay? And so the important points in this definition is that this the domestic violence is a pattern of coercive tactics. And the pattern is an important um, thing for you to remember when you start to do screening and assessment. So just kind of hang on to that for, for later, um, because that's one of the things as advocates that we, we use most often is looking for the pattern, right? And we're looking for a pattern of, of coercive tactics, you know, that these tactics can always change. We're not looking, you know, we're not looking for like five things. We're looking for all of the ways that this person is using power and control in an abusive or violent way. So we have, um, you know, it including physical, psychological, sexual, economic, and emotional. There's other things here. This, that list is not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. We also are really clear definition that this is perpetrated by one person against their, their intimate partner. And that's important because our field had to learn a lot about how while domestic violence is definitely gendered it's definitely, we're going to see disproportionately females impacted by violence to males. Um, but we're learning every day the ways that this, this is ungendered and the ways that it is affecting males. So I think that it's important for us to realize, for folks to hear that we changed that language. It used to be man, that a man against a woman. And over time, I mean, I've been in the field 40 some odd years. Um, we've changed that language and the language is still changing. Um, does include and probably only include intimate relationships or can include other domestic relationships? Oh, that's an awesome question. Um, I guess I am watching the chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Um, but um, yeah, it, it can and, and this is the legal, you know, the, this is part of the legal, let's see, if an offender is violent against their intimate partner, what risk does that give the children? Oh, that's a great question. Carrie, will you write that one down for me so I can come back to it? Because that's that's going to require, yes. um, I want to give that a longer answer. Yes. But, um, but definitely this idea of intimate partner, right? And for us, the coalition, right, and our staff, we, that is not a requirement for us 
in terms of providing support to a survivor. We definitely recognize um, caretaker abuse, right? We definitely recognize a, a adult abuse between roommates, adult roommates. We definitely recognize abuse between, um, uh, you know, people like with sexual assault, non-intimate partner violence, and non-intimate partner sexual assault. So, so, um, so, yeah, definitely, absolutely, it can be intimate, any intimate partner. Our field really started looking at that that intimate relationship, and actually, our field started. It was just married partners, and we've we've grown and evolved over time. Trust me, we will continue to do so. We're being challenged every day to broaden our definitions, and we're happy to do it. Um, and I will just, can I add one thing, Vanessa? Oh gosh, please do, yes. Um, uh, I will add also, we recognize that dynamics happen within same-sex relationships as well mm -hmm. with, with, in regards to domestic violence. And I know that based on, it depends on state for the legal statute. So, yeah, so we have as Oregon what up, Vanessa yeah. said that we gave you the ORS. This, so this is yeah. the Oregon statute. Also, some of our tribal na nations will say it, um, they define domestic violence as whoever is living in the household. And that does recognize that the larger family structure that sometimes is traditional um, in, within those community, indigenous communities. So it is a little bit different, even within Oregon, within those tribal sovereign nations, right? That we're the definition. So just yeah. for those of you who work closely with your tribal nation partners and um, those domestic and sexual violence programs, that's something to be aware of. Absolutely. And, and, and you'll see here in our field, we divide, define domestic violence Oh, I got carries it my way there. I can't see the rest of it. Let me move her. Um, as consist uh, with as a consistent pattern of abuse with a broad and inclusive survivor-centered approach. So that's just that recognition that there's a legal definition. And I'll just say this, which is such a sad thing to, to really say, but a lot of domestic violence and a lot of abuse is not against the law. And when you work with survivors, you'll realize that so much of what you work with, the, 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 the um, humiliation, the um, degradation, the cruelty, that there's a lot of ways that people can do that and it not be illegal. And, and as advocates, we respond in those cases exactly the way we would respond in any other case. We're not, you know, um, kind of, um, controlled or contained by these definitions at all. We just wanna share them with you. Okay, Carrie, I think we have to speed up a bit. Yep, I'll go to the next one. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna just really briefly talk about power and control wheel. It's something that is a, centric, a central part of our domestic and sexual violence trainings. We've used, it's historical, we've used it for a long time. Um, it's not a perfect tool by any stretch, um, but it's a good way for us to talk about tactics of abuse, and I'm, and I'm going to use it in today's training. I do want to tell you a little bit about the power and control wheel, just in um, because that's part of scholarship, right? You, you tell folks what you're using. Um, it was designed by Ellen Pence. Um, Ellen has passed away, um, but there is a YouTube vi video that if you Google Ellen Pence and Power and Control Wheel, you'll get a video of her talking about how she created the wheel um, and why, why it is used in our field. So I just point you to that, to that uh, extra homework or research if you take it up. And uh, just so folks know, I'll make sure that link's included in the next email to everybody following this as well. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. So here's the power and control wheel. So I'm going to talk a little Sorry. bit. Oh. There we go. <laughs> yes, here's the power and control wheel. So I'm going to talk about what you're seeing in front of you and why we use it. So the power and control wheel um, is a way for us to start to think about how violence moves in a person's relationship. It was often used with the second tool that we're not using today, which is the cycle of violence but I'll talk a little bit about the cycle of violence, but the cycle of violence and the power and control wheel are the two tools that we most often use to talk about how a domestic violence moves through a relationship and what it looks like. It's what I have learned from survivors over the years is these are really helpful tools to help them understand what's happening. For those of you who have 
helped a survivor or worked with a survivor or been a survivor yourself, you'll realize that um, the hardest thing for a survivor to recognize is what is actually happening to them. This is an incredibly painful and complex issue. First of all, it's happening in our most intimate relationships. It's happening in a way that um, creates a lot of, of uh, gaslighting and confusion and shame. And so these tools help us kind of vet, assess that out for survivors and, and begin to help them understand what is happening in their relationship. So the center of the wheel is where you see the word power and control. That talks about what's driving the intention of the perpetrator. So this, so you notice we could have alcohol there, or we could have depression there, or we could have um, historical trauma there, or culture could be there. But but what we've learned over the forty years of our work is at the center, what's driving that perpetrator's behavior is power and control. And we all want power and control, right? That's something everyone wants power in their life and everyone wants control over their life, right? Those aren't negative things at all. But what happens with abuse is that people feel entitled to have power over another person's life and control over another person's thoughts, feelings, actions, and behaviors. It's a way of removing their, their intimate partners of their personal agency. And that's where it becomes abuse, right? We all want to have control and we all want some element of agency and power, but we don't all want to use those to um, control our intimate relationships. So that's what's driving the perpetrator. So that's the center of the wheel. So if you look at the spokes of the wheel and those are the, I, I hope you can, can see the different words that are there. Mine's a little fuzzy. I hope that's just my screen. But those are the tactics that the perpetrator is using, right? And those tactics are the, the ways the perpetrator is maintaining or facilitating their power and their control, right? So a tactic would be intimidation, right? That would be a tactic to, of gaining in power and control, making threats, um, 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 you know, making threats or using, using money in a way that is intimidating. Um, another tactic might be emotional abuse, calling people names, humiliating somebody. Um, another would be isolation, you know, breaking down the other relationships that might um, serve to support a person, not allowing them to go to work or to maintain relationships with friends or family. One of the, the most recent ways this showed up for me in my work was I, had, I was working with a survivor whose perpetrator uh, was always on the phone whenever the survivor was talking to me. And so I, I was hearing them answer the questions that I was asking the survivor and that quickly let me know that the survivor wasn't safe. And so I had to shift my advocacy in some way. They were using isolation. Another way is minimizing, denying and blaming. This tactic of it's not that big a deal, right? Or um, I didn't really do it. You're 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 not you're not understanding what I really meant by that. When I called you the B word, it was just a joke. You know, it didn't mean anything. You know, or I was just angry. I put my fist through the wall. People do that every day. It's just anger. It's not abuse. That minimizing, denying, and blaming. Using children is another tactic. Saying you know, if you call the police or you call for, you know, you tell the doctor what happened or you tell your therapist what happened, they're gonna think you're a bad mom and take your kids away. And what's really scary about this tactic is it has worked. I have worked with so many survivors who have reached out for help and lost their children for a time. So these are, you know, so just know, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but these are the tactics, you have those. We're gonna talk way more about these when we do our second um, webinar, but just get that sense of the, the power and control are the center, the tactics are the, the way of the how, and then the physical and sexual violence that you see, that thicker outer wheel, that is all of the ways that the society and the culture, the patriarchy and all those other things are at place, right? There's just these the social norms that hold it all together. 
is the way I've come to think of that outer wheel. And you'll see different things in the outer wheel, but it's, and it's also what I, I like to, when I'm talking to survivors and I'm going over this power and control wheel with them, we often talk about how the outer wheel is the stuff that everybody sees, you know, the physical violence, the sexual violence, you know, everyone sees that and they're like, why doesn't she just leave? Or why doesn't he just leave her? Or why don't they get help? And, you know, it's everyone sees that, but they don't see, they don't always see those tactics that are happening. And they rarely are going to see that power and control at the center and what's motivating the entire cycle of abuse. So that's a little bit about the power and control wheel. I would love to just hear your thoughts. So if you, if anyone has questions or wisdom they'd like to add here, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, but what do you think about what I just shared with you? Here's someone I'm muting. Is that you, Carrie? That was me. Um, okay. I, I, I will just wanted to make, make one comment. I know this is a very gendered power and control wheel. You'll see her is the most in there. That's one of the things Vanessa was referencing that we're updating. And then we do have some updated ones. And there's some really neat ones when I send out the links to you following this about um, that also look at specific, have specific cultural elements to it to give you more examples about how each of these tactics may be used in different um, communities. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so elements of, a, of an abusive or violent relationship. And these are this now this is a very helpful piece for for screening and assessment. You're looking at a continuum of violence, right? Domestic violence relationships happen on a continuum. And what I have noticed over the years in working with hundreds and hundreds of survivors is is perpetrators are going to keep escalating these tactics of violence. So while one end of the continuum might be name calling, right, calling names, the next end of the continuum might be um, hitting. Another place on the continuum might be shaking or hitting. Another part of the continuum might be um, threatening. And then another part might be using weapons. And at the furthest end, it is kill, it's death. It's fatality. So we we as advocates work along every part of that spectrum and of that continuum of, of, of abuse. When we hear about hitting or name calling, we don't minimize because we know that it's on a path, it's on a journey of violence that can ultimately cost someone their life. So that's one thing to remember there's, that it's a continuum, that there's varying tactics that perpetrators use whatever works, right? So the tactics don't look the same in every community. They don't look the same in every culture. They don't look the same in every kind of intimate relationship. And so we can't give people a list of tactics. We used to actually do that. And now we've learned to really say that the tactics are varying, right? They're always changing and they're definitely rooted in people's norms, their cultural and, so and social norms. Um, that there is differentials of power, that power and control. You wanna look for you know, power differences in the relationship. And when I say power differences, I'm often, what I'm talking about are value differences. Who is, get, who is rated more valuable and given access to more agency? So that's when we say power differences, we're, differentials, we're talking about agency and value. And sometimes social, um, uh, social uh, norms, like in our society, when you think about who has most power, we're often talking about gender and class and race. And those things are no different in domestic violence relationships. Those things show up in the same way. Um, so uh, the cycle of violence, I mentioned that and inequality, and we're gonna talk more about the cycle when we talk about treating. So I think we've talked about this. I think what the only thing I, I think I should mention here that I didn't, because I think I've talked about pattern, power and control, perpetrators, actions are selective and targeted. That's something that I think survivors ask me to talk about all the time is that people, um, perpetrators of domestic and sexual violence can be very charismatic 
very kind and gentle in public, can be very much um, great leaders. You know, not all of them are. They can also have all other traits. But just know that the violence is very selective and targeted toward the victim. Everybody else in that perpetrator's life doesn't experience the same level of violence and targeting that the survivor does. So that's what I would, would say here that I think is important that I haven't already said. Thanks, Carrie. You ready for the next one, Vanessa? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll just reiterate what Vanessa said, how it progresses over time. So we do know that when it begins with the emotional um, and verbal abuse, and then it happens and it, it progresses um, shorter cycles faster over time. Okay. So this is a question that I'm sure you know, whether we say it out loud or not, many of us are thinking this question. Uh, why does it, why don't they just leave, right? If, if things are this bad. And I always have to include this in trainings, mainly because survivors ask us to, like, because it's the question they get most often, why don't they just leave? And so I just want to state that it's an oversimplification of the process of leaving that survivors go through when we ask, why don't they just leave? You know, um, Many survivors say that they're staying in the relationships because of their own feelings, as well as the different barriers that they have to face in just um, in leaving. So I think it's a good exercise to just take a second right now, even though, you know, because we're kind of speeding up our time frame, just jot down on a piece of paper what barriers you can think of or name, and we'll get back to those um, when we're doing our case study, if we get to that. Um, but just think about barriers, right? What are some of the barriers that survivors um, fear of what will happen if they do leave is a huge one, fear. Mm -hmm. And also I, I would say, and Carrie's about to talk about COVID impacts. And I think um, one of the big barriers that we're hearing from survivors a lot right now is that um, finances, thank you, exactly, finances. I, I was just about to say that you guys are so wise. Um, that's it. That's that's what I was going to say. It's the income. You know, people are, should never have to make a decision between safety and food and housing. But unfortunately, survivors are literally making that decision every day. Yeah. It's not, oh, that's a great one. Thank you, Barbara. You know, um, survivors often say, I mean, that's probably more common than finances in some ways, is fear of taking children away from their parent. Yeah, and thank you, Chris, unsupportive outside family members, right? Where will I go? What will I do? Um, and also, how will I be seen by my family, right? So there's a lot of stigma in being a victim in our culture. Um, none of us want to step into that role for any reason. And so it does require so much effort to think about how am I gonna, how am I gonna, you know, how my children and my family and what will happen and how will my community see me? Very legitimate barriers. Vanessa, would you like the next slide? Mm -hmm. In cultural conflicts, yes, Carrie, next slide. So we just talked about all of these because this group is so wise, so we could just keep flipping. Okay. Did you want to talk about institutional at all? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to, Carrie? You want to jump in with that? Yeah, so you all have given some great things around personal. You've really touched on some of those cultural conflicts and cultural elements and not wanting to be a, a single parent or looking like you broke up your family or maybe your religious um, background, you don't, you don't use the family stays together no matter what. And the economic, you all really got. Yeah, um, Brad, totally. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Carrie. Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. No, just, you know, that the cycle itself is a barrier. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Funny. And then institutional, you know, who, who, what institutions do you have to access to go in, you know, uh, to get help? If the criminal justice system is not a safe one for you, are you going to go that route? Or if you don't want your partner, if you're if you're in a same sex relationship, sometimes you're already looked at as being different. Um, and do you want to bring further impact upon that? 
Also, some of our institutions are really not set up in a way to support um, survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault, that they're, they're not set up in a, in a way to really be creative. And one mm -hmm. of the things that Vanessa was talking about before is how advocates really look at a survivor holistically and try to find support systems and, um, and safety plan on that for that individual institutions are, are not Great at looking and being flexible. Yeah. <laughs> now, Carrie, in the chat right there, someone talked about restraining orders. And boy, it, there's no greater example of institutional barriers than than some than what some survivors have to go through to get to get restraining orders taken seriously. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Next one, Vanessa. Or do you want to yes. talk about that? Okay. Yeah, and as Vanessa said, yeah, restraining orders, you can go through a lot. They are a great tool. And then in the end, they're also a piece of paper. So Carrie, so. we are at we are at 156. Oh, okay. So I wanted well, to I'm let gonna... you know that as you okay. jump into your COVID time, we do have a little time to make up. I'm gonna just really quickly go through the COVID-19 impacts because one of the things is we're still in the midst of it, right? One of the things is that we know that we don't we don't know all of it at this point. Um, so you will can see in, in the slides, um, you know, this is from um, some of our, our national network to end domestic violence has been doing a lot of support for the coalitions. As Vanessa said, there's a coalition in every one of the states and U.S. territories. And we come together, and we're talking about what is the same in our states and what's different. Um, so social distancing uh, is so important to slow the spread of the disease. Um, and the infection, but we know that those with domestic facing domestic violence are um, facing encountering additional risks. When you're asking to shelter at home and home is not safe, right? So that can be really challenging when someone most likely is themselves uh, confined in the same spaces with their perpetrators for prolonged periods of time, not getting the breaks that they normally would have gotten with going to work or maybe that perpetrator went to work or getting to see family or getting to go to church um, so, or getting to take your children to school might be times and periods of breathing and, 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 um, and being a little bit apart. Um, the National Network Stand Domestic Violence put this great guide together. I will share it with you all and it's a, a one pager um, it's a, a graphic and then some language too about how friends can help, you know, asking them how they want to connect, getting creative about uh, online play dates or study groups for their kids who are doing virtual school and maybe they can play a game online and that's how they can keep stay in touch and be creative and making sure that they know that they're not alone, even though it feels like they're alone in their home. Um, they really want to, we want to let them know that we're there to support them and we're going to try to figure out the best strategies to make sure that they get through this safely. It's also incredibly important during this time. We know that leaving an abusive relationship can be dangerous, even in the best of times. And I don't know that we let you know this, but the most, the, the highest, um, oh, I'm going to say it wrong. So I'll skip that in a minute. But the, the most danger a person is in is after they actually leave an abusive relationship because that's uh, 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 the abuser is doing anything they can to get that power and control back. So that's why we talk about that. It's always a dangerous endeavor. Um, but this is also really why it's important not to pressure someone to leave if they don't feel it's ready. Um, and that's something that our advocates really work on safety planning with survivors. And so we just try to make sure that um, other folks know that too. There's some common questions, you know, is it causing more domestic violence? You all have probably seen some of the news around this, um, you know, and uh, we don't know if it's causing more, but we do know that domestic um, abuse stems from post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, um, and many of you know that uh, having PTSD raises the risk of both being an abuser and a survivor. So while we don't have the evidence yet, there are people collecting this data right now, we'll know more in the future, there is some evidence that the rate of murder-suicide, which is one of the reasons this grant is out here, um, especially in which a male partner kills a female partner and then himself has risen since the same time last year, dramatically. Mm -hmm. So we do know that already. And Carrie, yeah, and Carrie, yeah. what I would add here is that when you think about the power and control wheel and the tactics, you know, when people feel out of control and feel diminishing personal power, 
those are times when we always see an increase in domestic and sexual violence. Like that's really something we can definitely have noticed both anecdotally and it also shows up, up in some of the research. So I'm not surprised we're seeing increases during a, during a global pandemic at all. And we're seeing it globally as well. Yes, yes, definitely. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so what makes physical abuse more of a risk during this time? You know, we know there's not always one horrific event that causes PTSD. Sometimes it does cause those symptoms, but it can also be a lifetime of exposure to violent behavior. Structural racism is also cumulative trauma. If the person is enduring microaggressions and comments and actions, um, that's important to keep in mind. Household members, while we know, and we already talked about it, how alcohol use during COVID-19, alcohol is not a cause of domestic violence, but it can be um, a um, impacted, right? So we, we know uh, nationally that alcohol use has been up during COVID-19 for everyone. Um, and if members are consuming more alcohol than usual due to stressors, they may be at a higher risk for acting out more and causing more physical harm. Um, still not the cause. Some might just pass out and go to sleep or happily sing and dance, right? Like it's not a cause, but it is, it is, a, it is one of those parts, parts that um, are, are playing into all of this. Vanessa, anything else before I moved on? Okay. Okay, I'll mute myself. <laughs> I'm talking to you with a mute on. Um, no, I think we're good and we're getting close to our break, our first, okay. our five minute break. Real quick, so you all know, we know we this grant's really around COVID-19 and fire, uh, COVID-19, but we also know Oregon, we're Oregonians and the wildfires have done even another impact. So I just wanted to let you all know, advocates are working in local programs and shelters and are facing an additional challenges as they seek to continue with those uninterrupted services for survivors. Our website has an updated list of where services are. We started that right away at the beginning of COVID-19 so that our programs could say, okay, where doors are open, shelters open, shelters reduced. Um, so there's some changes. Location's important. And I think you all know that we're at different counties or at different extreme risk, moderate risk, low risk. And so that impacts if folks are able to go to their hospitals to, to provide emergency support and advocacy, if their shelter, shelter, emergency shelters close, um, or if they're at reduced capacity. Um, but services, all those services are still being offered, um, sheltering and housing services. So there's more emergency um, funding for um, hotels and ho what we call hotel vouchers. And so there's more of that. Our courts are doing more things online and virtually. Uh, so restraining orders, they're supposed to have access to that and that might even provide a little more safety. They don't have to face their survivor or their abuser face to face. And some of our walk-in advocacy centers are still available with masks and signs and buzzers and trying really hard to make sure they have everything that they have uh, to keep themselves in survivor safety. So domestic and sexual violence services have pivoted since March so in, here in Oregon and nationally. And we're also, um, a lot of our state funders helped with some new technology. And I know many of you are familiar with that because you're using telehealth yourselves. Uh, we don't use that, but there's a variety of ways that we're extending or establishing new services via chat message, video, text, phone, email, and other digital platforms. Um, and I can't say enough about those emergency housing vouchers for money to go into hotels and uh, constantly looking for more housing. Vanessa, thank anything? Thank you, Carrie. Okay. Um, so it is 204. So we're going to take a two minute stretch break. Sorry, y'all, because we're speeding up here. But um, so let's come back uh, at 206. But just, you know, stand up, stretch, get, get a quick glass of water. Carrie and I will start back at 206, um, go finishing with the train. So you have a little break right here.
Okay, do you see this okay, Vanessa? I do, I do. I hope everybody's back from their break um, and refreshed. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the impact um, of domestic violence on um, mental health and depression and those kinds of things. So the next slide, the next two slides are actually statistics slides and I'm not gonna go take your time to read slides. You can read um, on your own. So Carrie, if you can just um, sh show me those. Oh wait, wildflowers, fires. Oh, there it is. I, I think um, there is one I do want to talk a little bit about. Um, the, the, this one's the impacts on mental health and what the research tells us. The second blurb down, I think, is really telling. And it talks about, this slide talks about that between 35, 37, and 63% of battered women um, experience depression. And that's, um, in, that's compared to only 10% of the general population. So it really does tell us something about how domestic and sexual violence is a, a impacting and affecting the brain, right? Because depression is definitely part of, um, we know from um, interpersonal neurobiology that it is very much a brain experience, right? Okay. So the rest of those I'll leave you to read on your own. And of course, um, as I um, start talking about um, impact on mental health and trauma, feel free to ask questions in the chat, to ask for clarification um, and or to unmute yourself if you have something to contribute um, to the conversation. That's very, very welcome here. Okay, so Carrie, the next slide. So I wanna talk about what survivors have taught me um, you know, I started out as a nurse. I started out doing psychiatric nursing and really started learning. Survivors have taught me most of what I know, even though I am trained clinically about these issues. And so I really, when I think about the impact on survivors, I always like to go back to what survivors are really telling me that they cope with day to day and how it affects their actual lives, their ability to, to work their ability to parent, their ability to take good care of themselves and their bodies. And um, because that's what that's what we really want to know. Like we can talk about it, you know, all of us on this call could talk about it clinically all day long. But it's important for us to think about the actual relationships that survivors are having with their bodies and with their environment because of the violence in their lives. And so let's we're gonna talk about it from that framework. So one of the first things that survivors say is that, <laughs> I'm just gonna use their language because it's not my language, but domestic violence makes me crazy, right? That's, that's literally a phrase I have heard. And if any of your advocates on this call, you, you know you've heard it too. And, and I think what they're trying to describe is how it affects our cognition, right? Our capacity to make good decisions, our capacity to recall you know, to make appointments on time, to learn, to finish school, to do our, our work well. Um, all of that is really affected by domestic violence. And, and one of the things that survivors really will articulate so clearly, and I wanna emphasize here, is that your decision-making is really impacted by domestic violence in your life. Right. Sometimes you just can't think it through by yourself. And that's why advocacy or therapy or just a caring family member is such an important person because it takes two to navigate this very, very often. Of course, there is the physical impact of trauma, the panic, the, the full body depression, the anxiousness and anxiety the um, some of the unhealthy coping strategies that survivors use of food, sex, um, alcohol, drugs, um, exercise, you know, any coping strategy can turn into an addiction when you're dealing with domestic violence. And these are conversations that are really important to have with survivors. And it's an understanding that's important for us as practitioners to really um, enter into deeply. 
Um, another one is that numbingness, that that sense of I, you know, that apathy and numbing, the inability to feel anything anymore, right? And that that um, you know that that nervous system collapse that happens with domestic violence, um, you know, sensitivity for, to stress, right? You know, the cup is already full, not one more drop, right? It starts to spill over into every aspect of their lives. Um, this loss of personal identity, something that survivors have often said to me, I think I heard it recently, was I don't know who I am anymore. I don't recognize myself anymore. You know, I'm not who I used to be. When you hear those phrases, that's about trauma and the impact of trauma and how it's changing the shape of their personality and who they know themselves to be. Very, it's very devastating. There's fear and shame and the inability to trust yourself or others. Um, one of the, the um, you know, interpersonal neurobiology impacts of trauma is the internalization of the perpetrator, right? It's one thing when the perpetrator's voice is saying that you're unworthy and you're no good and you're deserving of the abuse. It's another thing when it's your own voice because the perpetrator has been internalized. And it's quite common that survivors now are hearing in their own voice these same humiliating, shaming, and debilitating uh, narratives. And trauma affects the body and the brain, right? It changes how our brain and body relate and, and um, how we are able to navigate our brain body relationship through our nervous system. So that's a quick description of the impact of trauma. We're gonna go, you know, this is 101. This is our first conversation. We will go more deeply into this issue because I think this is an important issue to go more deeply into. Um, but I do wanna pause here and ask if there's questions or comments. I know there's practitioners on the call, so I'd love to hear if there's anything you would add to this list, I think that's an important thing. If there's something I've missed that would benefit the rest of the group that you know about, please add it into the chat. Um, and you can do that as I'm moving because I'll move to the next slide for time, but please be adding your thoughts and comments as well. Um, so I wanna talk about trauma over time. The, the slide I just discussed was really about that, you know, those first impacts. That's the trauma that we have in the immediate experience, right? And when we talk about toxic stress, I'm talking more about trauma over time. This is the impact of domestic and sexual violence on a survivor, on their families over, you know, years weeks, months, like this is some of that long standing impacts. Um, and the first one that I think is interesting is this covering up and providing misinformation. And this is survivors have taught me this and I have noticed as a practitioner that when abuse goes on for a long time, the survivor often that denial and that minimizing is you can't see what you can't see. And I say that because what, it, what that means is when it is too much and it's overwhelming, denial isn't a decision that survivors are making. And I, I know that practitioners sometimes get frustrated with that. It feels like, you know, why are they in denial? Why can't they see? But what we know about the brain body experience is that that's a survival mechanism in the human experience. So survivors kind of beginning to minimize, deny, um, all of that is, is um, part of the experience of toxic stress and trauma over time. Um, bursts of anger, that frustration, the raging, vasculating between shock, numb, disassociation and rage, this, the nervous system being so frayed and so fragile that we're vasculating right? Our limbic system is, is offline. Everything's just kind of firing really, really rapidly. Those impacts are, um, are happening outside of our ability to regulate them. So that you'll see that. And what I hear from providers often is that that just feels like you're dealing with someone that you as a provider can't trust anymore, right? And this is where survivors can tend to burn out their providers. 
And so when I'm educating providers, I really talk a lot about this stage of toxic stress and trauma over time to help mitigate some of the, um, the judgment and the confusion and the frustration that we can have as providers. Sleep disruption, which only makes things worse because we need full sleep to heal and to be cognitively vigorous and strong. Um, so that's, that's a huge impact. People stop sleeping for lots of reasons, but one of them is that a lot of domestic violence happens at night. Um, and so that inability to rest your body after years of toxic abuse can become very habitual to the brain and the body and the body just doesn't rest well. Um, and I talked about anxiousness. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is people pleasing, you know, tell them what, you, what they want to hear, right? Just trying to normalize, trying to cope. These are strategies that um, come up for providers as frustrations often is, you know, they tell me what I want to hear and then walk out the door and they aren't integrating. They're not complying with some of the things that we talked about. And just know that these impacts are not something that survivors can control, right? Their responses that their body is having. Um, so next slide, Carrie. So these are things that are directly out of support group. So I'm just gonna read some of the, or leave them for you to read actually, because I know that time is, is, is short for us. Um, the only one that I will add to, to kind of just say is that um, symptoms can be managed well with support. I really want that one to, to stand out for you, that all the things I've talked about that, that impact survivors impact us as well as humans. These are where none of us are immune to toxic stress, trauma, or abuse, not a one. Um, and just know that all of this is managed in community with support, with co regulation. We can manage all the methods that we're going to talk about. We talk about it. Carrie. Uh, Vanessa, you slowed down a little bit. You might want to do your oh, camera. Sorry, gotcha. you just kind of gotcha. slowed up a little bit there, but then you did can did it go through? Did you guys hear what I was saying or no? Should I say Not it again? the last couple, if you could repeat. What was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, survivors. I lost track. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Uh, managed. Managed. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> managed and supported. Good. Yes. Yeah. And so that was really. Um, what I was the point I was trying to make there, and thank you, Carrie, for catching that, is that Simpson, the symptoms can be managed well with support. And what I was saying is that each and every one of us, um, there's nobody who is immune to toxic stress, abuse, um, trauma. You know, that is the, you know, humans have those experiences. And the healing that can happen um, around those experiences is real, right? Sometimes when we're talking about all these impacts and the trauma and the cycle of violence and all of that, we forget that all of it can be healed with community and support and with effective interventions. And so um, I also said I wasn't, I'm not gonna read all of these what survivors tell us, but I would ask you to read through it and just take in what survivors have said. These are literally their words. Um, so next slide, Carrie. So this is an important one that I want to spend a little time here about toxic stress in the perfect storm. And this is specific to culture. So again, if there's folks who this speaks to your culture, your community, feel free to weigh in and add to this. I don't want to speak for every marginalized community. But this actually, this slide comes out of a support group that happened here in Portland, Oregon, at the Healing Roots Center. It was, it was a, a, a four-year study with African-American and Latinx survivors of domestic violence and depression. Um, the study, if folks are interested in the study findings, I can make sure they're included in the um, handouts that go out to you all. Um, but this slide is created from that support group. And it's an example, it's a story that survivors gave us about 
what it feels like to be in the middle of toxic stress. And so uh, the survivor, we were in a support group and the survivor was talking about, I was talking about trauma and I was doing this whole conversation about our neurobiology of trauma and our limbic system and our prefrontal cortex. And we were really kind of, I was in the weeds of this and, and really getting in deep about how trauma moves in our bodies um, because we were, it was a depression study. And one of the survivors stood up and says, you know, Vanessa, it's like a perfect storm. And they said, you know, it's like everything that my ancestors went through, all of the historical trauma, the enslavement, the, um, the torture, the, all of the historical impacts, be, you know, forced family separations, um, rape, you know, all of that history of abuse, that's part of the experience of that I'm having. And then they said, and then you add to that my personal trauma, being battered by my boyfriend, um, my boyfriend being incarcerated for four years because of the abuse, um, being abused as a child um, prior to my relationship. So that's all part of it. And then they said, and then add to that, all of the ways I've internalized this abuse, right? All the messages of I'm not worthy. I deserve what I get. Nobody will ever believe me. Um, no one's gonna take me seriously. I'm never gonna be able to get out of this, right? I'm not a good mother because I let that happen. And then add to that, I reach out for help and I'm met with systems that again, say to me, I'm not worthy or we can't help you. We don't have enough resources. You didn't fill out the paperwork right. You missed your appointment. <laughs> you know, uh, you broke the restraining order. Why are you drinking, right? So there's this way that the system also, and so this historical trauma, personal trauma, internalized oppression and systemic oppression become this perfect storm of toxic stress that makes it very difficult to break the cycle of violence. And so I always take time to tell that story because it really changed for me, kind of popped me out of my clinical conversation for one thing, um, but also really helped me understand how people live with all the things that we talk about every day. Carrie, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I don't think I have anything to add. I, that story is always a really good one. And it looks at that holistic nature of how we try to do the work. Right, yeah, thank you. Okay, so the next slide, um, impacts of barriers. I think we've really touched on all of this. I think it's important for us to know what one thing I will note that you can go back and read this slide, but one thing that I will note is cultural norms and family history can become barriers to accessing support. Uh, services. And people don't often think of it that way, but what we have learned about who can be a helper, what um, safety even looks like, or um, what has happened in our family when our family reached out to help, all of these things are at play when survivors are making the decision to access our services, whether it's calling how can number five be a barrier? I'll get to that, but Carrie, tell me which one is number five. But, um, but what I'm saying is that, you know, whether it's calling a hotline, going to a support group, calling the police because you see violence in the relationship, you know, next door, all mm -hmm. of those cultural norms in history come to play. And which one's uh, five? Number five is the promises to change or get into therapy. And that, uh, Brad, if you put in front of that, the abuser is promising to change or get into therapy. Yes, and, thank you. Yeah. And go ahead, Vanessa, speak to why that's a impact is a barrier. Yeah, and, and that's a barrier to getting help because so often it's like, it, it really speaks to what survivors wanna hear so deeply. They want deeply to believe that this person can change and get therapy or even that therapy can change abusive tactics. The, the research isn't clear on that, right? 
Um, change is, you know, we all know change theory. We could talk about change theory all day, but change is a process and it's not an easy process for any human to go through. And therapy is a, um, is a method that can work in some um, abusive situations, but not all abusive situations. So it's, it can become a barrier to act, accessing the services that will um, benefit the survivor in moving on from the relationship if they choose to do that. Carrie, do you want yeah, I think exactly. the only other thing, I, yeah, yeah, it's false expectations and hope. I mean, one of the other reasons people, when people say, why don't they leave? It's because often it's, they want the violence to end, not the relationship necessarily. They might love this person and they want that violence to end so much. So they're going, that is going to be a hook, a little, a, temp, a treat, like, I'll, I don't leave. I'll change. I'll get into therapy or we'll go to therapy together but it's not an even playing field. And it can be, yes, a carrot, Brad. <laughs> the carrot, definitely, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's the carrot to please stay here. And some, maybe that person is, yeah. often what we do with survivor planning is, okay, and if it doesn't work, what's your next step? Yeah, right? Like, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So Carrie, we are at 2.30. Yep. So I want to just let folks know that um, we will get to, all of, we'll get through all of our slides. We're gonna do case reviews in the next um, presentation. So we're not gonna get to case studies and case reviews today um, because we wanna give those time for lots of discussion. And so we're just gonna um, get through the PowerPoints and we will get, we will definitely do case review when we're, when we're talking about assessment and, and safety planning. We're gonna go into the weeds of that next time, but we'll get through the best practices right now. Okay, Carrie, go. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about privacy and safety first. Um, and one of the big things, and many of you are familiar with confidentiality, right? And I just really quickly put on this slide, confidentiality is the legal or ethical requirement. And privilege, privilege is actually the rule of evidence prohibiting disclosure of contents of written or verbal communications. So I wanted to let you all know that advocate privilege is, um, domestic and sexual violence advocate privilege is both in federal law, the Violence Against Women Act, which is VAWA, and FIPSA, which is the Family Violence Prevention Services Act. So those two have our federal statute language around what guides domestic and sexual violence definition of privilege, uh, of confidentiality and privilege, what it means, um, and it's pretty strict. And then Oregon also has a state statute, so that's where you can find that one, and, um, and that's where certified advocates and victim privilege is laid out for Oregon organizations and Oregon domestic and sexual violence advocates. Um, and I can talk to you more about that um, if anybody has questions. But why is co confidentiality so important? Um, and if you all want to try, uh, type into the chat box, I would love that. And I'm also going to um, go through my talking points as well. If I miss something, please let me know. Um, it enhances survivor safety. Often when we're talking about confidentiality in the health realm, it's about privacy. You know, I have a right to privacy. If, when I'm talking to my doctor, or my counselor about what I want, um, but that's my business that, um, you know, the different um, uh, medical needs that I may have are about privacy. But when we're talking about domestic and sexual violence and stalking, it's also about safety and safety makes um, our confidentiality and our privilege statute even that much tighter and um, and just really, really airtight in a way that some others' um, uh, guidelines are not. Um, it preserves the dignity of survivors, right? That's right around pr uh, privacy. And it also empowers survivors to move forward. So when we talk about safety, it's really sometimes a disclosure and can escalate that violence and it can reveal a safe location of a survivor and it can compromise the entire safety plan that that survivor has put together. 
Um, and then we're talking about dignity of survivors empowering. It reinforces the principle that survivors control their personal information. And it is so important for all of us as individuals that we have an ability and a right to control our personal information. But survivors often have not had that ability to due to the abuse. So it also links the healing, but it also links back to that safety plan. A survivor may not be telling you all the details of where they're at or um, their location or what their plan is because they may, they, they may need to keep it close to the vest. That may need to change right away. Um, if they've already been found by their abuser or they know they maybe they've moved into a, a emergency shelter, that emergency shelter is two blocks away from uh, family members who are um, supporting the abuser, they're going to need to shift again. And so it's really important to us that survivors decide if, how, and when their personal information will be shared. That's really at the core of what domestic and sexual violence advocates do. So what, and one of the reasons is what happens when they do get uh, lose control of their own information? We've seen it be used against survivors in divorce, custody, and child welfare cases. Um, we also see that it's manipulated by perpetrators and their lawyers in criminal cases. We also see um, when they lose control of their information, it affects their employment, it affects their access to education, and it definitely over and over again affects housing. So it can also um, affect a survivor's health and or re-traumatize their survivor if they have lost that. Someone breaks their confidentiality or has in the past broken it and then it's, uh, broken again. It also can af affect their relationships with family, friends, and the community around them. Okay, any questions around confidentiality and privilege? I know I went through that really quick. It is one of the things we'll dive more into the wheel weeds of, and I, it's something I would really challenge you all to think about before our next training, where that might um, come up uh, in your relationship as the organizations work together. So we're going to be talking about that in our second training and our third training. How do we work together? What are some of the differences in our roles? Where, you know, how can we navigate that? Um, and so that's really why I wanted to give you this background and the philosophy about why confidentiality is such a core piece of what domestic and sexual violence advocates do. It's also a way that if in a community, you know, I know my neighbor found, I found out about my neighbor, you know, being in a domestic violence situation. Do I want to go in and call that hotline? Will I go in and talk to somebody about what's happened to me if I know they're going to be reporting it or if I, or if they're going to be, um, if confidential, that organization has broken confidentiality before, how can I trust they're going to keep my information private? So I'm going to give it a minute. Okay. Tasha, uh, you wanted to mention the dynamics when you're a mandatory reporter and how that can import, impact the reporter and the family. Um, so I, because we're running out of time, I don't want to go too much into it, but I do want to let you know, unless Vanessa, you think um, if you want to. Well, I just, you know, we can, I, I want to hold that. I mean, we will definitely dive into more about that. I just wanted to make sure that folks knew that advocates are not mandatory reporters. Yes. Yep. And that that's an intentional part of our advocacy over the years was to protect advocates from that role. That doesn't mean advocates don't report with survivors about violence or abuse in children. Absolutely. Um, but we're not, we don't have the mandatory reporter um, uh, obligations. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we don't, and we'll dive more into the philosophy and background on that, and that it is important to know, and then also our releases of information and the mm -hmm. details and the best practice and the timelines on the release of information in, yeah. the, in our next workshop. Yeah, yeah um, when we, mm -hmm. and when we talk about assessment and screening, we'll talk about risk uh, of reporting and how to report safely. You know, like I said, I worked as a nurse. This is something that's very important to me is how do we, as under the cl clinical obligations to report, you know, I, I have been a mandatory reporter most of my career. And so that has been something I was 
um, I've been really thoughtful about. So we'll, we'll talk more about that when we talk about assessment and uh, screening and referrals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We're gonna move into best practices next. Sorry, I have two arrows on my screen. I got it. <laughs> so best practices. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk through some of these. Um, technology and safety planning. We were talking a little bit earlier about how the programs are pivoting right now and how you all have been able to pivot during this COVID-19 time. Having more things online. Many organizations were doing that before, but definitely now during COVID-19, this virtual time. Um, we've been able to pivot to still be accessible to survivors, um, to be accessible to our um, clients. I know my neighbor is a counselor and she said sometimes it's really helpful because they're in their room and they've been describing it to me, but now I'm actually there with them and we can safety plan or talk about different things together. Um, and you don't usually get that. Um, so, you know, these options can make it easier to access support, but there's also tips that we know and we work really closely with our national partners around um, technology. Um, and so we do a lot around technology safety planning. We talk about different safe ways to communicate. And there's different uh, things that we need to think about as we do this um, technology during this time, whether it's on the phone or the computer. It could just be, I'm not safe to talk on a phone, even if it's a landline, because who's in my home? The example that Vanessa gave earlier, hearing the abuser behind them answering the questions for them. So if they're home with their abuser or they're home, maybe they're a teenager and they're reaching out about a sexual abuse or sexual assault that happened and a fa another family member is there that's um, not safe for them to talk about it with. Um, what if someone can see their conversations if they use a text line? What if they are, have a family plan on their phone or their parents are regularly checking it or their abuser has um, is regularly checking their texts? Um, what if I use a chat line? What are those safety considerations? Um, your computer has a history and a memory and remembers those things. If that computer is not private or other family members or other roommates, housemates have access to it, they might stumble upon it by accident. Um, and what if somebody is actually monitoring my device activity? And that happens often in the in domestic violence. It happens so often, monitoring your device, monitoring the children's device, monitoring social media sites, having your online um, passwords and access. Uh, so we do a lot in our advocates, I want you to know, have training and then the coalition, we do training around uh, survivor technology and safety and, a pri and a pri there's a technology safety and privacy toolkit. Um, that is accessible for survivors through the National Network 10 Domestic Violence Safety Net Project. We can get it to you right away. And it is translated into a few other languages as well. Um, Brad, I see that you wrote in the UK, they started an Ask for Annie program that victims signal to a pharmacist that they need help. What's interesting, and I'm just gonna touch on this really briefly, this happens in a variety of ways. Somebody says, oh, you call the pizza place and you say this code word. The challenge is sometimes survivors have been done amazing things, right? And then and then people want to pick up on it and we can use that safety plan, but then it gets pushed all over social media. Abusers see it too, and then they know that code word. And or that pharmacist may not know what that code word is. The pizza folks definitely not necessarily going to know <laughs> what that code word is. So we really try to encourage folks to get out the best thing is to get out our crisis lines. They're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, they're trained advocates that answer those lines that can be like sometimes, I mean, over the years I've done this, since the early 90s, I've been working with survivors. I've gotten some funky phone calls on those lines where somebody's talking, oh, oh, okay. No, this is not, this isn't the pizza place or this isn't your, uh, nope, I'm not your grandmother, but okay, let's start to talk through this on my end. You know, and advocates know that and they get really, crafty and creative about how to do that. Um, so that's just one of those those informations. We don't consider it best practice for right. code words just because no. location, state, background, language access, there's a lot that can go wrong there. Yeah, definitely. Vanessa? 
Um, so yes, let's go to the next slide. Okay. This is you. Okay, so we're going to talk. Oh, let me get my camera off because it keeps doing that. So um, uh, I'm just going to touch on some of the best practices uh, without going. I'm not going to read the slides for you, so because I know you have them and can read them. Um, but I think in terms of best practice, what have we actually learned are the best things for us to be doing in terms of domestic and sexual violence response and intervention. And Carrie just touched on one is we need to understand the use of technology. It's best practice for us to do that. So the next best practice I wanna talk about is we need to think about our organizations, the container that the survivor is entering into and whether or not those organizations are equitable or do, have we applied universal access? Have we thought about liberation back, uh, based strategies as opposed to, um, you know, strategies that are more punitive? Um, are we in partnership with domestic and sexual violence organizations? You know, really looking at the organization is a best practice strategy. So the next slide, the next uh, strategy, best practice strategy, we can, um, we can skip that one, Carrie. That's again, organization. So the next best practice strategy that we wanna think about is safety. Survivors are going from danger to safety. And so it's, our, it's really important for us as practitioners to think about what are the universal elements of safety. And it's important for us to be practicing that in everything that we build and do, from the forms that we're asking people to fill out, to how our waiting room is structured, to um, how we talk about survivors when we're debriefing one another, right? Are we using uh, victim blaming language or shaming language in our personal conversations? Um, are, we, are we really practicing good listening skills where we're doing what I call deep listening, which is listening with our whole body, with our whole self. Um, you know, do we have, do we know how to do safety planning? Um, do we know how to listen without minimizing or dramatizing the risks that we're hearing? Can we listen in a neutral way and be able to respond from a place that allows people to be grounded regulated and safe? Um, are we taking good care of ourselves as practitioners so that we can show up each and every day with our full attention? Are we getting enough water, nurturing, sleep, um, all of that? So creating that is a best practice. How do we create safety? Carrie, the next slide. So the next one is responding. There are definitely best practices in terms of response, how we um, start conversations with survivors, how we deliver our referrals, how we um, lead our support groups, how we have the conversations with perpetrators about batters intervention programs, how we talk to other clinicians about our clients. All of that is response. Um, and some of the best practices for response are deep listening, being a healing presence, knowing very clearly how to identify risk, which we're going to go in deeply at the next one, knowing how to do safety planning, really understanding the strengths and limits of our system, what we can and cannot do, and how do we provide information and not advice. And we'll practice this next time. So don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll really get into these um, into these best practices in a more um, clinical way when we, we have our next meeting. And um, response is all about prep, training, informing, educating, intervent intervening, and referring. And so um, we, those are ways of, you know, how do, we, how do we build our containers? What do we know? What is our expertise? How do we share information? How do we ask for what we don't know? What, do, what are the limits and the scope of our own interventions and when and how do we make a referral, right? Those are really, that's the meat of what we're gonna teach you um, as we move from this basic kind of overview into a more in-depth training where we're actually practicing skills. 
So what I want to say um, is to just remind us of what we've covered today. Um, let me go, Carrie, can you go back to our, well, no, got it. Um, no, 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 you can keep going. I've got, I've got the paper here. So what we've covered today is we talked about the prevalence of domestic and sexual violence. We've really talked about the definition of violence. We've talked about patterns and tactics. We've looked a little bit about how COVID has affected our work. We've di discussed the impact on mental health and trauma and toxic stress, specifically on domestic violence survivors. And then we've done a really quick overview of best practices. And that's what we um, intended to cover today, it, it, except for we were going to have a little bit of practice, which we're not going to do. So Carrie, can you flip to the slide that talks about what we're going to cover next time? Yes, I think it's on there. Can you see it? Next, oh, webinar. next webinar. Yep. So just know that our next webinar, we're going to talk about, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, safety planning and um, skills. We're going to talk about assessment protocols. We're going to look at several different kinds of screening tools. We're going to create a referral checklist for you that will help you know what kinds of referrals to make and when. Um, Carrie's going to go more in depth with advocate privilege and confidentiality. And I'm going to discuss a little bit, a bit about what I've learned about mandatory reporting as a best practice and, and some risk assessment with mandatory reporting. So I'd like to hear if there's anything that you would like us to cover in the next webinar. I want you to just feel free to let Carrie, myself, or Narmala know. Um, these are your trainings. We are building them out for you. Like today's training was based on the um, uh, feedback I got from Narmala and some of her coworkers about what would be helpful for you all in this first training. Um, but um, let us know if there's more you would like to learn. And Gary and I can just open this up for questions, thoughts, concerns, feedback. It would be wonderful to hear from you now. Yeah. Vanessa, there was the question at the beginning you asked me to write down. Do you want to sure. um, do that one while people, yeah, well, people either, are doing that? You can either unmute yourself or type in the chat box if you have questions. Um, and so if an offender is violent and a children are present, what is the risk to the children was the question. Um, I know we That's do a, a great training question. on the impact of children, but I'm assuming that somebody used risk purposely. What is the risk to the children? Yeah, there's, there's lots of different ways that children are harmed, not the least of which is the emotional um, trauma that happens when they are in the, um, when they are present with domestic violence is happening. And we know that those are lasting long-term impacts on kids from just the psychological and emotional impact of being in a domestic violence, um, be, bearing witness to the abuse and trauma that's happening in your parental relationships. Um, but honestly, children have been harmed as a tactic of abuse. So there is a risk for the child to become a target we know when we, I don't think we're gonna talk about lethality factors. That's not one of the things that normally mentioned you all would, would like to, to cover. But what we know from our lethality work is that children are at particular risk for fatality when they're in relationships where, the, where guns are, are in the house, but also when they are not the biological child of the perpetrator. So that becomes an additional risk factor. Another risk factor is that children often, depending on um, their, their age, infant children are at great risk for being harmed while the parent is being harmed. So an infant child while they're nursing or co-sleeping, which is a whole nother you know, training is why people don't, shouldn't be co-sleeping. But, um, but survivors do, right? Because it feels safe for them to bring their children into um, bed with them. Um, but that, that's a very specific risk for little kids by being in a domestic violence situation. And the other risk is older children trying to protect a parent and trying to intervene and becoming the target that way. So those are just some of the quick ways that kids can be harmed. And, um, but if you have more questions, um, I can include a section on that in the next training. Carrie, is there anything you would add to that or anyone else? No, on you the had it. I was going to talk about the children intervening. Um, um, there is some specific safety planning, just so you know, if we if we do want to go into that. 
um, uh, that uh, child advocate, domestic violence children's advocates do with children about what happens when the violence happens. Is there a safe place in the home to go to? Can you leave? Uh, is there a safe neighbor? Like they do have some safety planning with older kiddos that have that um, that ability. Um, and so then we also do, care. our advocates have um, training as part of their core advocacy training on impacts of domestic violence on children. Mm -hmm. So those those mental health and wellness impacts or yeah. on uh, children. So Carrie, can you make a note that when, when I am, uh, building out the training for safety planning that I include um, the children's safety planning. There was a chat person said they want that. Yeah, so we Barbara, can, we, we see that. Include. Okay, yeah, we'll build that in. Okay. Any other questions? We are at uh, 2.55. I have a child blowing a note under my door just to let you know what's happening here. <laughs> it's full notes with yes or no check boxes from the Normala, I want to invite you to unmute and just uh, let me know what you're thinking or noticing in the training as you've um, uh, been kind of a support to us as we've built this out. I'd just love to hear from you. So while Normala does that, um, I see you're unmuting Normala. Great. Uh, Vanessa, I'm also going to put the evaluation link up. Okay. So we don't lose anybody. Um, and just so you know, uh, PSU is doing evaluation during this project. We appreciate them so much. And if you fill out, go to this link and fill it out, uh, Rowan also put it in the chat box for you to easily click on. You're entered into a drawing for a $50 gift card for each of the trainings we're doing. So yeah, normal. I'm Hi. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Not a problem. Hi, Vanessa and Carrie. Thanks for a great uh, pre uh, training today. You know, I really liked the slide on uh, privilege and and um, confidentiality uh, because I think that's going to come up quite a bit in our mental health world. So um, I'm hoping. I don't know if people ask questions, uh, you know, enough uh, questions about it, but I think that's an important piece. And the other one was in our mental health world, we don't do a lot of advocacy work. So I loved. Uh, you know, I love the uh, discussion and the slides on, you know, what's an advocate uh, oh, God. and how do they as maybe assume some of those, you know, part of that role, even in their mental health world. So I don't know whether you have any kind of practical uh, uh, suggestions uh, for them. I think a lot of us are well trained in trauma work, uh, but may not have been in the context of domestic violence. So I liked, I liked what you presented on, you know, toxic stress and DV. Mm. And then I also liked the, 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 the slides on the intersectionality, mm. uh, especially in my work, you know, we had, and in your work too, we, we are very focused on equity Yes, and you know how uh, often we have the intersectionality of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, disability, and or you know special mental health challenges. Yes. So, yeah. um, I think bringing it to people's uh, awareness today was uh, was great. So, thank you, Narla. Thank you for your help in building this out and. So folks, just, uh, I think we're probably at time. Two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. So uh, were there any other questions or comments? Uh, again, we want to hear from you. We're building this for you. So let us know what you want to know. Um, and I think, great. I just put our website up there just so folks are aware. Um, you can also click on there. There's an interactive map. I know you're getting to know the, your partners in your community, but if you just want to see where other organizations are, um, and that's and th that's where the recording of this training will sit, but we'll also send it out to folks as well. Yeah, and just know that also on our website, while we're thinking about the website, is there's a ton of trainings on there that are webinars that are available to you. So you could just cruise over there and look at things, look for trainings on equity, Doing trans, you know, working with transgender survivors. Mm -hmm. um, there's th there's a couple of there's a whole series that was done several years back now 
that was done by Chris Hafine and a couple of other uh, mental health professionals. It's very specific to the work you are doing. So Carrie, can we put a link to those three, do you think? Um, yeah, I'll the find mental them. Health webinars. Yeah, th because I think- I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing because it's a little bit easier for me to find it that way. And I apologize, my daughter was asking me where something- Oh, no problem. And no, I thought it was- all good. This is all good. Um, but Barbara asked about participation certificates, um, if we would make those available. Absolutely, no problem. Um, Rowan, Rowan loves when I do this, by the way. But Rowan, if you could um, uh, help us get the certificates done, that would be really helpful. Is that possible? Can do. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Vanessa? Uh, Marmala, did you have something to say? Yes. Just one more uh, 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 request, or maybe, you know, I know you spoke about it today. In particular, I don't know whether we can have a little handout or you can uh, maybe send us a link someplace for mental health providers where they have a better understanding of those coercive tactics. Oh, yes, I can do that. Where yes. they can use mental health services against you. Yes. Uh, you know, or substance use disorder services, or even diagnosis kind of against the victim in anything from courts to custody to, you know, just telling them you're unstable. So if there is anything like that, that you can maybe give to mental health providers, because we are not steeped in that culture. So sometimes having yes. something handy like that is a good reminder. Oh, that's a great idea, Normula. We will do that. We will pull that together as well as some links to some of our national partners who have done some of that work. So we'll pull some stuff together that's specific around tactics. What a great idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Rowan just popped in the right. link into the, into the chat. So you all have the link to the other web oh. webinars on our website. Thank you oh, so much. Rowan's amazing. Okay, every, everyone, um, have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy MLK Day. Um, yeah, it, it'll be good. To, it's a good time to celebrate um, him. So take care. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.